Dave Monk, your Prairie Monk, WAFT Champagne 90.1 on your FM dial. And uh, it's almost New Year 2022. So we wish you a happy new year and thoughts for what you might do in the future. Uh, we've been working a lot with uh, warehouses and workshops and things like that. And uh, there are a zillion different idioms of workshops and uh, warehouses. Uh, but let me tell you that uh, Heartland Pathways has had various attempts to work with uh, various workshops and they've been very productive. We've had to move around quite a bit. At one stage we were in the old old railroad station in Champaign, which has now become a black dog saloon uh, and a very successful one that's been functionally reused. We've been <clears throat> in a pepsin factory we had hoped that it would be a uh, functional uh, reconstruction of a uh, factory that happens when uh, the process becomes obsolete or when uh, the process moves overseas to I get a, uh, to have to pay less to manufacture. They're called gray fields and they can be extremely successful. Uh, they, uh, if, especially if they're near uh, a highway uh, in, or an expressway. In case of the Pepsin factory, uh, both would affect. Uh, there's a Route 72, an expressway, which would place an old Route 47, which was a, a highway between Monticello and Cisco, uh, Genter, and uh, into uh, Decatur. Uh, we had hoped to produce uh, native plants there. There was a good laboratory, but it required a certain amount of daily, almost hourly input. If you're going to do that sort of thing, you need people on site to do that. And we hadn't developed that sort of sophistication with prairie, you need to have uh, containers for plants that will germinate the seed and then <clears throat> the seed needs to be transplanted into deep containers. Uh, <clears throat> they can be narrow containers, but the roots of most prairie plants are deep and uh, <clears throat> that can be a problem because greenhouses aren't always set up for that sort of situation. And <clears throat> people who do that sort of work are not all always uh, au fait with uh, <clears throat> the different uh, planting paradigms. Uh, you need to have a, a soil that is relatively friable but firm. And you need to have a certain understanding of what prairie can survive in 
as distinct from weeds. And <clears throat> you need to know something about the viability of the seeds that you're collecting. Some plants don't have a lot of viability. Some plants have a tremendous amount of viability. <clears throat> uh, so the pepsin factory uh, was a good place to try to do that. A huge amount of room space. The factory had been re retired. There was a, a, a roof problem, but uh, it was a, an excellent attempt. Uh, other places, we had a, a little sewage plant on South First Street that belonged to the Savoy uh, village. It didn't, it, it, it was more or less was used by uh, the uh, Lake Park in that general area. And it had been replaced because it was too small. And so the sewage had been connected to the Southwest treatment plant. And there was a, a lift pump there, but <clears throat> otherwise the facilities were empty and we were there for quite some time. And we used the uh, sludge feds uh, for plants. Uh, we used that to improve the, the quality of prairie on the Lake Park Prairie that is between First Street and between Winfield Village, and parallel to Curtis Road. Um, but one day I came in from Monticello and I'd been going past Route 10 in Bonville and I saw a car, a pickup truck there. And I was tempted to <clears throat> ask if there was warehouse space, workshop by space. And <clears throat> it happened that there was a small company was going to do something with pop pop uh, golf and didn't end up doing that. It was a, a small apartment uh, that uh, was warmed and could protect um, photographs and slides and a small uh, kitchen and uh, this was relatively ideal. It was a dream. The, the, uh, oh, the warehouse was large and occupied by several different people, including the owner, David Borges. Uh, we, we, interacted with each other in, in helpful ways. And there were truck doors and uh, room for space on the lawn. Uh, some of the things that Hartland Pathways was doing at the time was combining science, biology, the protection of prairie with rail trails on the ballast of abandoned railroad beds and the possibility of re-rail. Uh, we're just uh, about seven miles out of town or about four miles from the west side of Champaign. And that uh, we thought was near enough to be uh, an appropriate place to visit. We were adjacent to an existing railroad line that serviced um, Seymour Elevator and Bonville Elevator and Staley Elevator. And 
we were aware that there was a interurban railroad station that uh, introduced people to a way of life where trams or interurban trains, lightweight trains, perhaps only one or two cars, uh, would run parallel to the railroad. There was also a wooden elevator there. It's that people know what early elevators were like, unlike the more modern circular elevator or concrete elevator. They were square and they were small and they were serviced by a siding that would allow 14 or 15 cars to be loaded. Uh, <clears throat> there were scales, uh, way bridges for the deposit of grain from road vehicles bringing in grain. And uh, the interurban depot <clears throat> had all the elements of its existence in <clears throat> from about 1900 to about middle 1950s. The, there was a, a, a rising part <clears throat> that uh, held a motor, <clears throat> motor that would boost the uh, <clears throat> current for the interurban. And that electricity also became the first electricity for the small communities that were serviced. Uh, <clears throat> you can see today the holes in that upper uh, architecture where the power lines went in and received a boost from uh, probably a motor, motor that generated electricity. The uh, <clears throat> interurban depot had a characteristic style. It was <clears throat> probably run by IT, which was the uh, Illinois Traction Company. And the depot has the character of uh, bricks and <clears throat> uh, viewing devices so that you can sit inside as a station master and see the train coming. <coughs> so there's this little segment of character was there in Bonville, a few hundred yards from the warehouse. And then we start dreaming. Uh, the art side of things we felt could be handled by a, a lawn architecture. Uh, to do that, we uh, purloined a group of C.V. Lloyd uh, boxes that were used to uh, capture uh, audio sound uh, as distinct from electronic sound. And C.B. Lloyd's changed dimensions and went in a different direction. And a lot of this equipment was uh, left in dumpsters and uh, it was salvaged and some of that equipment <coughs> has been there with that dream. We've had uh, puppet shows and uh, we've tried to do things in the open space as well as in the closed space. Uh, 
doesn't always work successfully. Uh, when you have a boneyard festival, uh, the last day is the day when people in the boondocks get to express their artistic generosity. Uh, if you're in an open space, that sometimes uh, involves rain. So we had one attempt to create a, a, a tree structure with a little blue stem that <clears throat> would create a tree that would burn. And uh, so that structure was directed with the help of a bobcat, which would lift the artist up to the tree. And that was going to be a lit on a dry day, but unfortunately it rained. So uh, we face, if you're doing outdoor art, you're going to face that sort of situation. And if you're going to keep it going, you need tents and retreats where you can handle water. But we tried and some of that equipment remained. We have the evil intent of having a, a, perhaps a ball there, a dance, a dance event. We uh, painted a wall white so that we could project pictures onto it. And we uh, got that sort of halfway on the way, but sometimes ideas uh, don't always uh, meet, you, you try and, and uh, so the potential was there, a rather wonderful site with uh, probably about a, at least 10,000 square feet of space. The, the site had been a site where uh, United uh, it was a company that used to make uh, blocks uh, and they poured blocks and when they were finished, they would take them to this site, uh, Allied Casting, to knock off the glitches. So this was a sandblasting operation <clears throat> and there were huge cages uh, to uh, carry those heavy weights and they were the sort of cages that you could put a, a front end loader underneath and move. Uh, so we had to live with a little bit of sand and a little bit of mud coming in with trucks doing, going to different parts of the establishment. Uh, we had people who would come and volunteer to process seed, to collect seed. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that was a, a viable operation. Uh, we didn't do silk screening there because the silk screening would have to be out in the warehouse and the possibility of dust and insects would make for interesting silk screens that would have a scratch where a fly would be dragged across your silk screen. Silk screen needs a little bit of protection. You just can't do it anywhere. We do it sometimes in the street, but the, uh, that's under emergency and we're doing it rough and tough. Uh, so dream on, we uh, have used that site effectively. Uh, one student came to planning, uh, Chris Carl, and he saw we uh, we had space. And we also had wood. We'd been collecting wood from the Staley elevator, and it would be sisted together, uh, perhaps five or six uh, boards at a time. Elevators go from 
uh, flat boards that are two, two by 10 to eight by 10 to six by 10 to four by 10. So you have a, a thick wall and uh, the steady elevator was being taken down as obsolete because development was moving west and for, uh, around the uh, Prairie Gardens area. And uh, we salvaged some of that wood, especially some of the, the bigger dimensions. We had people there taking that wood apart. Dave Borges put up a, a, a structure for us to put the boards on so they didn't rot outside. Uh, you could almost enjoy the, the sound of taking nails out of boards, uh, uh, this sort of screech, uh, uh, and, and you would have fun doing that. Uh, so some of these boards became signs, and uh, some of that material was still there uh, until recently. Uh, Chris Carl uh, sent his master's degree thesis on the railroad beds that we have, and he uh, used the open space in the warehouse had a small crane to lift up materials. He was uh, in lockstep with what we were doing. He, he was more an artist than uh, a planner. He was wanting to take some of our wood and create a sculpted piece. He was aware that we had a, a, a yeah crane. It was, I found it at Armenia, way up near Peoria. Paid $400 to get it to come down. And at that time we were occupying Shady Rest and stored it there. It was the sort of crane that you put on a railroad when you were repairing it or when you were creating it. <clears throat> it has a uh, ability to swing around <clears throat> to uh, go karts that carried ties and rails, and it could create its own railroad and put in a spur line and uh, quite functional. Uh, Chris converted it to a <clears throat> a road train and lifted his sculpted piece and took it around to in front of a wooden elevator at Armenia. And that was interesting. He, he knew how to weld. He modified the space some uh, so that he had room to work. <clears throat> and <clears throat> interestingly, he <clears throat> brought in friends from Wisconsin who worked with him on a sculpture farm there, where if you want to express yourself with your sculpture, you can uh, rent the space by actually maintaining the farm. And those people came in and, and helped to uh, create uh, Chris's concept of a sculpted piece. And that became his uh, master's thesis. He had to learn quite a bit about prairie. He, we have good prairie on the west side of the Sangman River near to Allerton Park. And <clears throat> he uh, created uh, signposts that could be put in and someday we will hope to follow his thesis through with a, <clears throat> a uh, trail, a rail trail that we hope will be a basic prairie trail. Uh, that means we would hope it would be not too uh, 
uh, wide uh, that it might even have to be fenced so that the plants would not fall over the trail. You have to consider whether it would be a one-way trail or a, or a two-way trail, mm -hmm. or if you have to have stopping places so that bicycles can pass. Uh, so <clears throat> a lot of dreaming in this situation. The, the uh, university was approached by Fran Hardy to uh, give over a mile by 66 feet of cornfield to a, a created prairie so that uh, it had been observed that rattlesnakes had been in this area. Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes had been there. And <clears throat> that was uh, encouraging the rattlesnakes to migrate and become part of the university's territory. They're in, on the other side of the river, they're in existence. Sometimes they uh, are a concern of biologists because they hibernate. And if you're gonna burn a prairie, you need to burn the prairie before the hibernators come out. So <clears throat> sometimes if the firing has been a little late, the uh, Massasaugas uh, get uh, bitten by the fire, and that's kind of sad. But you also watch the mammals and uh, other creatures around, and you balance between the prairie and the forest, and with what advances and what doesn't advance. If it's a the fire, is probably going to allow the prairie to to advance, and if it's no burn and the forest will advance. So all that uh, related uh, to the thesis that Chris Carr was doing and uh, he got his master thesis in planning and that was another function of the Bonville warehouse or workshop. It's often difficult because it costs to rent uh, such space and the cost has to be balanced about your other expenditures. So there's always an argument about whether it be there, but invariably when natural history people get underway, First of all, they need a CEO, an officer that will combine things and bring things together. And they also need some place to store equipment and materials that frankly are not used all the time, but they're very valuable when they are used. Uh, so the Grand Prairie Friends has been doing this over the years and they've saved uh, uh, spaces where they can have people inside if it's a rainy area or they can use it as a, a place to start uh, a, a workshop or uh, have open houses so it's very helpful you have to budget for this uh, now comes the end of the year and uh, agencies like Amazon are looking for distribution space. And we know that this is a possibility then the possibility is that we have to get out. And that happened, we got, we were renting by month. So we had a month's notice and a little more than that. It took a, a little bit of shock to realize that this was going to happen. We we're going to lose a rather uh, nice site. Uh, and uh, uh, so we got underway. It's a bit, it has been a rather wonderful experience just to go through some of the things that we have 
collected. If you have a warehouse, you collect. Uh, it might be a, a piece of log that has been rolled around in a, uh, Lake Peoria for 20 years uh, and made to look the shape of a, a, an egg. It probably was a pylon that was too tall and been sawn off and dropped into the water. And I picked it up when it was waterlogged, almost too heavy to lift. Uh, so you, I rolled it into the back of a pickup truck and it's been a friendly uh, exhibition piece for a long time. So you look at that, you, you look at pieces of coal that exhibit certain uh, carboniferous era plants. Uh, so is this anthracite coal or is it a, a more Illinois coal with high sulfur? Uh, there's a story there. Uh, and as we uh, emptied the, the area, we came across all manner of things. A, 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 an, an antique car, which is almost an aberration because it is too, we're, we're too poverty stricken to afford uh, an antique car, but uh, we happen to be uh, aware that this was a uh, possible purchase and we did so. Uh, it will find a home, we're not quite sure where, but uh, that came with storylines and uh, Peter B. Alexander has a garage and he's a, a sort of assessing it at the moment. We had the help of uh, Gus Borches helping us to take that vehicle out. And uh, uh, it, it's the sort of vehicle that I would like to see to stay, to stay local. And so you have to think about whether that would go to a a museum? If so, it has to have someone uh, like the Monticello Railroad Museum that has workshops and, and uh, exercises their uh, rolling stock. If you have a, an antique vehicle, you need to exercise it. If you don't exercise it, it will rot. The, the uh, uh, various rubber elements in the, the uh, gas pump and things like that will rot. And you have to make sure that it, it doesn't have mice that find a home in there. Uh, so having an antique vehicle may be interesting, but uh, a challenge. It's tempting for people to ask a museum if they would like to to uh, buy such a uh, vehicle, but <clears throat> that's premature. You need to come to a museum with uh, a provenance, a record of who owned it. In this case, it was the Southern Tea Rooms and it has a story about it. Uh, so you uh, tend not to ask questions too prematurely because then the answer is no. It's like working on the railroad line. If you want to burn the railroad line and you want to ask a direct question, <clears throat> then <clears throat> 15 attorneys will say no. But if you explain what you're trying to do and how you do it and what the uh, controls are, then it's likely that that will be approved. Yeah. You just have to be careful that uh, you <clears throat> you get your act together, and it may take years to get your act together. Mm. We're, we're dealing with one such act at the moment. We're looking at the concept of a a green burial with a prairie on top, and that you have to think of very carefully because. The tradition has been to uh, uh, 
have chemicals to uh, preserve a body. Probably goes back to the Civil War when bodies couldn't be transported easily, then you could uh, embalm them and send them home. Uh, and so that's become a, a fashion. And <clears throat> if you start to think about a compostable body and a prairie on top, then that's, that's a kind of new concept. You have to handle it rather carefully because you, you don't always do that. Some societies don't uh, cremate their people. Yes. Some, uh, there are customs where uh, you might uh, scatter ashes. Uh, uh, but some communities don't even have a um, crematorium. So uh, you have ideas, you put them away and <clears throat> they don't always work. Uh, sometimes they work very well. There are people who come along and say, what can, can I do with this thing? And this thing, you might even know what it is. Uh, and they say, oh yes, we know what it is and we can use it. And so that you handle on. Uh, so it's been fun to, to go through these little bits and pieces and to, to realize what has happened over the years and what might happen in the future. It may be that we don't have a, a warehouse. We're going from a Heartland Pathways that has been a, a rather amorphous group to a more uh, structured group. Uh, not unusual. Uh, and that structured group has to figure out what the hell they want to do. And uh, it might be quite different from what has happened amorphically. Basically, Heartland Pathways has been an agency that prompts people to do things that might be interesting, whether that be a, uh, the purchase of a railroad bed in the Monticello area, 33 miles, or the involvement with Shady Rest, uh, 30 acres of ground uh, now with a uh, soil and water conservation easement, which is an indication that there's nice wildlife there. It's on the banks of the Sangman, uh, some bottomlands, some uplands that are uh, uh, the uh, Cerro Marine expressing itself. Uh, so some of the uh, things that we have, not only the crane was a, a railroad uh, piece, but we, we had other uh, railroad equipment. We stored barn pieces that would have wooden pegs. So many barns were put up without any nails. And so you have teaching uh, elements. You have uh, pieces of elevators that have been taken down. Uh, a bucket that would take a crane to a, a loft, uh, to a gearhead where you had to put grain into bins so that they would uh, be loaded equally and not sink into the ground and fall over. Uh, so uh, there are pieces of wood that thousands of tons of grain have moved across and they've sculpted the, the uh, wood framework. Uh, uh, one piece of wood that I forgot to say was, was from a Busey uh, uh, development on Green Street where there was a, a tree and there was a debate about whether the tree should be saved or the tree should come down. And, and so I have samples of the cross cut and the long cut of the stump of that tree. And that is a teaching material. Not everyone's going to see it. It might be a museum piece in the long run, but it's, it's, 
it's a stimulus for other people to start thinking. Uh, the, that's how you get to have park districts and forest preserves and conservation districts. And then how you have museums. Museums are tremendously difficult to handle because there's no money for them. And <clears throat> there's a lot of controversy about what should be preserved. Is the big name item or is it the practicality of the day-to-day -day clothing and uh, uh, the, uh, the trains and the railroad tracks? Uh, we have little pieces of interurban rail compared with pieces of uh, mainline rail. Uh, and uh, Tom Scott from the Champaign, Havana and Western Historic Railroad came and picked those things up. We had uh, pieces of wood that uh, you put into the spike holes. Now the spikes are square, so the, the wooden plugs are there. And when we lost uh, rails on the Conrail Bridge over the salt fork of the, the, the middle fork of the Vermilion River, we plugged every hole on of every spike that had been removed. That was to prevent the water from getting in those holes and rotting ties that were big. They're not, not just railroad ties. These are usually about 10 feet long and, and 10 inches by 10 inches. They're huge. And they, we never get that sort of uh, bridge tie again. Uh, in, preventing it from rotting is important. And it's that sort of material that uh, is stored and Tom said, wow, yes, we're uh, on the way to recreating a railroad on four miles of your uh, abandoned railroad where you were abandoning in four prairie, but we would like to bring historic trains in from the Monticello Railroad Museum to Champaign. And we are getting secondhand ties from the ADM in Decatur. And that means that they have holes, spike holes, and we can use those plugs. So they found a home. Uh, I kept a few because I'd spent a lot of time plugging up holes on a, a quarter mile long bridge that is 100 feet off the ground and uh, 998 ties and three holes here and three holes there. And uh, then when you finish doing that, you have to saw the top off so people don't trip on the, the, the plugs because if you trip and you fall a hundred feet, you die. So, <clears throat> uh, and you need the hammers and the axes and the uh, dollies and sometimes the vehicles to make that sort of thing work. It depends on who comes along and who has a skill and what that skill might be. Uh, so as we're taking out things, uh, there are some things that uh, people have, Packer included, have uh, been working with houses that are at least 50 years old, uh, do an excellent job of doing, picking out materials that people might want to restore such buildings. And for years and years, probably 30 years, they have been uh, doing this and doing it well and encouraging people uh, to more, do more of same. They hold an annual meeting each year that just gives awards to people who do that sort of work. Uh, even so, the, the, uh, the mind that preserves 
preserves different things. Uh, uh, I can think of a, a roll of, of, of cotton gauze, which doesn't cost that much. It might be $5. But for me, that is uh, how you strain paint. It's how you uh, <clears throat> use it uh, in different ways. <clears throat> it's very easy to throw that out. But uh, it was interesting. We, uh, we eventually evacuated and we had seven shopping carts outside with leftovers. Some of them were interesting pieces of tree, uh, the sort of thing that would go to the idea store. Uh, sometimes very technical things, uh, uh, the donation of a sign making machine that really needs a professional to run it. Uh, in that case, you don't just put it out for sale uh, or it will become uh, steel or uh, uh, salvage. Uh, but if someone were uh, an antique dealer, uh, that is one of those things that is totally functional, but absolutely obsolete because it's been taken over by the internet and this sort of thing. Uh, some of the seed is uh, has gone to uh, rough and tough sewing. Uh, sometimes when you have uh, volunteers, there are only so many jobs that you can provide that are doing jobs. If you have 50 students that come on a certain day, then it's very hard to find jobs. Burning is interesting, but they have to know what they're doing. Uh, picking seed is interesting also. The, the problem with fitting, picking seed is you don't always have uh, the real estate to plant the seed. It's, uh, uh, and you, you, you don't have the sophistication. You, you don't know the viability of the seed. You don't know, uh, you don't have a laboratory where you can take the seed and grow it and see if 90% of the seed grows or 10% of the seed grows. So you know how much of the seed to plant because you, if it doesn't uh, grow very well, then it might be that you need to be, have more seed. Uh, so you, you have things that people can do, but not many of those things. You, you essentially boil down to the six or eight or 10 people who uh, are knowledgeable enough. Uh, I watch WEFT, which has given us our, our opportunity to, to broadcast. And uh, there are, uh, you can sweep the carpet so many times or wash the, the bathroom or, or uh, polish the windows. But the people who are essential are the people who know how to uh, work with the broadcast board to be able to exchange uh, recording equipment to know how to work with the computers to bring in information, first of all, by uh, vinyl record, then by CDs, and, and now just by uh, internet connection. It's, it's a, a, a challenge for people who want to help. It's a challenge for people who want to help help us help. Uh, what are the things that they can do? They, they can uh, put together envelopes, they can do artwork, uh, 
but even the artwork it needs people who understand Ed Hadley does hard work for Weft and it's, uh, it's it has character and it, uh, I see the last uh, invitation has a color uh, uh, artwork on on the outside of the envelope uh, that indicates a certain degree of sophistication and encourages people to to contribute to a very viable station and so you have to look for the people who may do that sort of thing. Often we're very dependent on media people. David Whitsunny has had a lot to do with helping us get uh, still photographs, maps and charts and videos into our regular ra radio program. And uh, he does that pro bono. And Bill Sandler before that has spent about 18 years uh, doing the same sort of thing for us so that we could convert our radio program, take a photograph of it and put in the maps and charts and visuals that gave character this, to this sort of program. And that was what some of what happened at uh, Wanville. We had two very big tables that were very good for doing artwork. But boy, were they hard to, to move and, and even give to people. Uh, included there was a, a, a large steel desk that was almost too big to go through the doors. And that was hard to uh, say goodbye to, but it also was hard to just to give to someone and someone took it for free. And that was, that was a wonderful. Uh, it had another life. And uh, we had a lot of lockers that we put all our equipment and, and historic things in there. And uh, they were taken to um, the normal way. People made donations, uh, but Basically, they could take things for free if they needed it. If they're going to use things, that was uh, a wonderful thing to to contribute to the Parklands, Hutlands work uh, in total. And some of the display cases have gone and found another home, and they've generated a donation and. Uh, but some things were left, and we've been very grateful to have a, uh, uh, the owners, David Borchers and Gus, his son, to, to allow us to use front-end loaders uh, to take out material that was uh, too uh, big for us to break down with a sledgehammer. Uh, some things we did break down with sledgehammers. Packer is knowledgeable about doing that. Uh, it's kind of sad to see some of your fond memories and others go into a dumpsters. We have two dumpsters there, and they will be each probably about $700 each, perhaps even more than that, because one was very tall. And you tend to dump viable things, office chairs, and then if you don't have the opportunity to sell, and you're not in the right place at the right time, then that doesn't get functionally reused, it gets salvaged. And in this case, it goes to the landfill. Uh, their packer is very good at taking out the steel of of, of items and uh, uh, so Todd's satellite is Todd's satisfied is a specialist in doing that. He's been uh, mayor of Urbana for a period and and he's treasurer for the uh, Packer and and his one of his specialties is to to watch for steel. 
that could be reused. And uh, we have posts, uh, steel posts, and and do you save them? Where do you put them? We have a, a locker. We have two lockers, big lockers, in U-Haul in a banner because they are uh, heated and that helps to preserve photography. We've stored uh, archives there. Once again, with archives, you have to be careful uh, not to just say uh, can, to a historic museum, can we uh, give you archives? They might not want them. And that's very premature. What you must have to do is to, to uh, find someone and somewhere where the archives are documented and, and you see what you've got. Uh, is there useless material there or is there a story? And it might have to stay around for 20 years. Nobody has the time and the energy and the money to to store something like that for 20 years. But we've sold. You know, they're, they're in a locker in U-Haul. And we hope that we will find a historic uh, developmental e economics person who will look at the names and the people who worked there and uh, the prices of the goods and chattels and uh, see uh, what, what the storyline is about this Greyfield, which was the Pepton factory with a history in Monticello, where State Street had more millionaires than you could uh, poke a stick at. And uh, is this product, uh, Pop Pepson, was going around the world uh, and was helping to uh, create a, a, a different medicine, medicine for a diarrhea and uh, constipation and things like that. So it, it's still being produced as Pepto built on, uh, but we have archives. <laughs> we hope that Monticello or someone would take an interest in that, we're not so sure because there was a period when there was a clamor for to take the, the factory down where 20, 250 people worked. And, and so you have to have a, a sympathy and an understanding and it's not always there. So many of the things that Heartland Pathways does uh, are loose and don't necessarily have an answer. And, but amazingly, people will come by and find uh, an association and then become uh, important. Just to, to ride with volunteers who have volunteered with Packer after retirement and to, to talk to them and, and figure out what are the things that they uh, like to do uh, and it's healthy these uh, people have bodies and souls that need exercise and enthusiastic exercise and they do it well and uh, <clears throat> uh, we have to applaud that and people who know their onions if they leave a job where they've been mightily involved and go into retirement where they're uh, not mightily involved, they need to to go and volunteer because if their head and body doesn't work, then shortly they will die. And doing things in a volunteer manner help you to uh, stay alive and do interesting things. So PACA has a number of those people. And uh, they've been remodeling their sales yard. So some of these materials get sold and support uh, projects. Uh, uh, Packer will give grants from time to time to people who are doing interesting things. And uh, we have even been recipients of that sort of support. 
so uh, we applaud that sort of volunteer agency. Uh, Tom Grazier is a, is the uh, in-house person, and there's debate about what you should sell. Do you allow something that is less than fifty years old to be sold? Uh, do you uh, become a museum? No. Right, but yes. Uh, uh, where do you put this story? Where do you put the glyph or uh, the unusual piece of equipment? Uh, and uh, how do you help people to build or rebuild or repair a table or uh, and that's on the sidelines too, functional reuse. Unfortunately, sometimes when the time is short, we have to resort to a landfill that sits on top of an aquifer that uh, waters 80,000 people and sometimes takes in PVCs that leach into the water and so we have for a moment we have regional planning which uh, says we don't want this to happen and that's not very easy because people don't like to be told what they can can and can't do but uh, we go back to that sort of situation in Monticello where we we have to figure out whether we want a train to go down to Shady Rest uh, does the museum buy the land or does the museum lease the land? Does the museum buy the land from Heartland Pathways and lease Heartland Pathways a, a, an easement for a trail? Uh, <clears throat> does the uh, Accelerator Museum want to come into Champaign? Perhaps not. So then you, you find the people who do want to bring people into uh, historic trains into the champagne and, and you uh, try to convince them that this is a period piece and it could come into a, an area between State Street and, and Randolph Street uh, <clears throat> and uh, give people room to think about a different era. I'm, Go back to uh, reading a book about uh, English, the trappings of Winston Churchill and Randolph Churchill. And I wonder if Randolph Street had anything to do with Churchill's parents and Randolph Churchill. And you have to know that these people uh, were dukes and earls and kings and queens and how did they get to do what they did right up into the 1870s and the 1900s and uh, still there's history here i'm looking at the clock i forget when i started but i, I can roll on about some of these things and it sounds a little repetitive but uh it's important uh, we're, we're looking at uh, ideas, uh, and one of those ideas might be a green cemetery with the prairie. So that has to involve uh, a lot of thought. And, and uh, do the leachator from the shrouds go where and who drinks the, uh, the, 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 the uh, leachates? Uh, is that better than having a, a, a embalmed body slowly decay? Uh, so uh, lots of debates there and lots of interesting thoughts. And we hope that you will continue to do that. And Adam Pathways, I think, will continue to ask questions and poke their nose in and and suggest to the Department of Transportation or the Department of Natural Resources or the Interurban 
uh, abandoned railroad or an old that wrote 45. So there might be a uh, prairie pathway from Rantoul to to uh, Paxton, and then that it might up meet up with a, a cross section of uh, another railroad called the Pumpkin Vine that is an east west uh, rail trail already developed in Rantoul. So, so bring. <laughs> think beautiful thoughts and uh, dream and uh, and follow through. Uh, you have to sometimes uh, leave your special interest and become a, an administrator to to get the idea underway. And then you have to find the people that might take the idea and run with it. And they do. Sometimes it's a need for an inspiration, and there you might be. And, to, and that's why one might take a, a train into Champagne for an inspiration for, for young people to think about transportation and the history. And da, 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 da. So we thank Weft and we thank uh, the Urbana Public Television for their involvement. And this has been Dave Monk, Prairie Monk, WEFT Champagne 90.1 on your FM dial.